Hey there everybody, welcome back to Marketing Research. In this conversation, we're going to learn a few things together. First, we're going to identify which business problems call or don't call for marketing research. We're going to identify the key stages in the marketing research process. We're going to translate business problems and research problems into research questions. And we're going to distinguish the difference between research questions and hypotheses. First, let's talk about the marketing research process. The marketing research process, if you Google it right now, is often broken down into a number of steps, sometimes as few as four. I have also seen attempts to break down the marketing research process into 26 steps. Um, <laughs> clearly, there's quite a few differences in the way people present it, but really, um, although I'm going to do it just one way here, uh, I hope that after our conversation today, you can appreciate that regardless of how someone presents the process, there's all common shared traits. And there's another piece of news here. I gotta be honest with you, I'm not really teaching you the marketing research process. Instead, we're really just talking about the research process. Um, marketing research is just conducting research about marketing phenomena, but good research transcends domains. First, we can break down the research process into four broad meta categories. Step one, we need to figure out what the real question is that we need to answer, establish research question and objectives. Two, if we know what question needs to be answered, then we have to design our research project. In other words, we have to draw a blueprint up that plans out exactly what type of data we're going to collect, how we're going to collect it in order to answer that question properly. Presuming we design our research to, uh, to satisfy us, then we go collect the data. And while we're collecting data, we go watch out for real world sort of problems. And once data is in hand, well, we analyze the data and then we honestly and accurately report the results. And we go back and check to see if we actually answered our original question to our satisfaction. Um, arguably, in step four here, things might be a little different for the marketing researcher than sort of the traditional researcher. Uh, this step, in step four, we often also play the role of sort of the analyst, where we take the results and we add in some reasonable assumptions or managerial insight or marketing knowledge in general, and we provide suggestions or advice. And that's where the researcher switches a bit into the consultant role. Now, let's break this out a little further into 11 steps. We're not going to go any further than this. I think this 11-step process does a pretty nice job of breaking out all the key sequence of events that have to happen for a successful marketing research project. First, we need to establish that we need to conduct marketing research. It's going to cost us some time, money, and effort, so we should figure out that it's worth our time. Then we have to define the problem. And given if the problem is defined correctly, we can then actually figure out what the objective of our research are. As we're going to find out a little later in this conversation, these three steps are actually perhaps the most challenging of the entire marketing research process. Then we design the research. Overall, we, just, we determine the research design, so we figure out the broad type of approach that we think is appropriate to address the question. Then we figure out exactly what types of information and sources we're going to use to draw um, the, inf the data that we're going to need to investigate our phenomena, whether it's secondary data, primary data, where it's going to come from, how we'll collect it. We're going to determine how we're actually going to go get access to that data. And then, if necessary, we're going to design data collection forms. This might take the form of a survey, a uh, checklist, an interview protocol, or some sort of spreadsheet that we use to aggregate secondary data that we collect from elsewhere. Then we actually go out and collect that data. We have to determine our sampling plan and size. So our plan lays out the process that we're going to use to draw our sample. And our size, we don't want to spend too much time and money and effort for excess amounts of data. It costs us a lot of resources to collect data, so we don't want to get more than we need for the project. So we have to sensibly figure out exactly what the appropriate amount of data is that we need. And then we go collect it. Finally, we analyze the data based on our research plan. So at this point, we should be conducting analysis that's consistent with what our plan originally was. And sometimes we also engage in additional exploratory analysis. And then step 11, we prepare then present the final research report. Finally, it's worth mentioning that while this process is presented as a linear process, meaning step one to step 11, that's almost never really the case when we do a marketing research project. Uh, in many cases, we circle back, reevaluate, um, and work on other aspects of the design simultaneously. So in other words, at step seven, where you're designing your data collection forms, you may realize through the process of creating your data collection forms that really you didn't even design the right research design in the first place, or 
Maybe you actually didn't ask the right research question, so you circle all the way back to step three. Uh, these sort of things happen, and that's just the reality of marketing research. Okay, with the marketing research process laid out, let's focus in on this big first step. Let's figure out the problem to solve. So in here, we need to figure out the business problem, and then we need to translate that a business problem into a research problem or a research question. This is much harder than it looks. It's the early grave of many, many marketing research projects. Unfortunately, what often happens in marketing research projects is you design a beautiful study, you collect high quality data, you do flawless analysis, and then you present the results to management only to find out that's not really the question they wanted answered in the first place. In other words, we definitely need to focus really hard on making sure that we figure out what problem really deserves to be solved. So first off, how do we actually know a marketing research question is potentially worth investigating? Well, at the bare, bare minimum, we actually have the necessary time, money, and resources to conduct adequate marketing research. So if we're confronted with a business problem where a decision needs to be made no matter what within 24 hours, it's unlikely that we'll be able to conduct a rigorous study to answer that other tools, resources, or decision-making strategies will have to be deployed. When we're looking around to see if there, if there might be a trigger for marketing research, there's three places that might uh, trigger those uh, that need. First, uh, the marketer already took a specific action. They deployed a tactic or a strategy or a part of their marketing campaign, and it failed to meet objectives. So in other words, you had an intention of what you meant to do, and you thought it would do something, but it failed. That's a good indicator that there might be a need for marketing research to evaluate uh, what went wrong. You observe, another trigger is that you observe an opportunity or a threat in the marketing environment, but you really need to know more. Uh, this might be inspired by reading a think piece, for example, on Fast Company or Wall Street Journal, and you realize that something that's been shifting in the environment might be relevant to your business, but you really need to conduct more research to find out if that's true. Uh, also, you might realize that there's assumptions in your tactics or strategy that could have dangerous consequences if wrong. Uh, for example, if you were developing a new edible snack to compete uh, and replace Gogurt, and if you don't know what Gogurt is, go look it up, it's, it's pretty gross, uh, and you really think that new Gen Z kids are just absolutely just clamoring for a Gogurt style replacement, well clearly that's a big assumption that you're making. If you spend all the time money developing, uh, research and developing a brand new product replace Gogurt and launch a large national campaign to release this product, um, you better make sure that there really is in fact a market for this and your target, your target market isn't interested. Here's an overlooked reason, a uh, thing that we should think about if we want to find out that marketing research is really worth being conducted. You need to verify that management is actually willing to take action based on the results of your research. Um, unfortunately, it's human nature to have preconceived biases, it's, which means managers are often very attached to their decisions or the decisions that they think are best regardless of the evidence. Uh, confirmation biases amongst a litany of other cognitive biases in humans uh, are to blame for this. I'm sure we have seen this amongst our aunts, our uncles, our family members, and ourselves where no matter what is the evidence that's confronting us, we're tempted to recontextualize and interpret it in a way that benefits our pre-existing notion rather than changing our notion. Well, we need to verify that if we're going to spend time, money, and effort conducting marketing research, we need to confirm with management that the results of that study will actually influence their decision making. Otherwise, we're just wasting resources. Um, as an example, a good way to overcome these sort of inherent biases is to, be f to set something called an action standard. An action standard ex exists before you conduct the study and with negotiation of management. So as a completely arbitrary example, I'm just making this up, um, here's an example of an action standard. Uh, if greater than 60% of current ARC customers, that's the Access Recreation Center, are uninterested in using the rock climbing wall, we will replace it with cardio equipment. This is an example of an action standard. Again, for those of you who love the climbing wall or hate the climbing wall, this isn't real. It's just a hypothetical example. And what we're doing here is, if you, you can imagine that people who work for the ARC or, ma ARC or managers at the ARC each one of them probably has a different attitude about that climbing wall. Some of them love it, some of them think it's maybe a waste or too resource intensive given the amount of use that it gets. So some people probably would like to see it go, some people would love to see it stay. If you're going to endeavor to spend time, money, and effort to collect data to find out what your actual customers think about it, you need to listen to those customers and you need to listen to those results. So before you collect any data, you set some standard that will actually influence your decision. In other words, 
if the research says X, some objective criteria, then we will engage in Y, where Y is some sort of meaningful business decision. Finally, collaborating with management, the marketing research team needs to be able to translate the business problem into something amendable to empirical evidence. In other words, as we talked about earlier, marketing research is all about collecting objective empirical evidence, meaning objective observations in the world, to answer questions. That means the business problem has to get translated into something where we believe we can collect data to address the problem in some meaningful way. If we're never able to actually reach a consensus with management about how to do that translation, in other words, what type of data will help you address the problem, then we really shouldn't go forward with marketing research. So let's do a little thought exercise based on some of these principles that we just said earlier. Uh, let's imagine that we might be doing a consulting project for Stone Brewing Company. Now, um, you know, instead of a problem, maybe this is an opportunity. You know, maybe, maybe Stone Brewing should consider entering the malt the alcoholic malt beverage market. Um, based on some data from 2016 in the US, the flavored malt beverage market, so the Mike's Hard Lemonade, Smirnoff Ices of the world, are, uh, is currently valued at about $986 million. Now while craft and microbrew is valued at about $2.8 billion. So the craft beer market that Stone clearly competes in is larger, but let's not look away from the flavored malt beverages. It's a big market. So, you know, an open question might be, hey, Maybe Stone Brewing should get in on that sweet, sweet action. Should, maybe they should do their own Stone Brewing malt beverage. So the question I'm posing to you here is not whether or not they should do this, but rather I'm asking you the question as the marketing researcher of should we do research into whether or not this could be valuable? Hmm. I'll give you a second to think about that. Hey, it actually looks like Stone Brewing actually introduced their own flavored malt beverage at some point, the extreme lemony lime. It's fresh-tastic. Now, for those of you who might be a little more familiar with Stone Brewery, you might guess that this image on the left-hand side here is a joke. In fact, it's an April Fool's joke. And those of you who might know Stone Brewing a little bit better, maybe for their most famous beer called Arrogant Bastard Ale, you may know that Stone Brewing is pretty hardcore when it comes to their commitment to craft beer and their disinterest in producing beers that'll be consumed by what they deem as sort of this uh, unsophisticated alcoholic drinker. In fact, one of the owners, Greg Cook, that you see on the right here, he's, he's a pretty big extremist. He's a diehard when it comes to craft beer. He's an advocate and he's quite passionate. So the point I'm trying to make here is that even if we did a marketing research study that showed that Stone Brewing could make a good amount of money by introducing malt beverages, there's really no reason to actually conduct this research because management will never listen to the results of that research no matter what it says. They're driven by belief in this case. And that's okay. And it's okay for us to realize this isn't a place for marketing research. So I threw around the idea of a, a business problem a little bit earlier. Um, what actually constitutes a business problem? So I'm gonna give a few examples here, but one of the ones I actually like, uh, I've heard people say before is Sherlock Holmes and the dead body. The idea that uh, Sherlock Holmes stories always were really good at introducing to the reader a clear problem. So let's see, three things that, can, that, that trigger the need for research. In the case of Sherlock Holmes, investigation. In our case, marketing research. So first, we need to be in a state of uncertainty. In other words, we don't know something that needs to be explained, and we already understand what audience will care if we solve that problem. So in the case of Sherlock Holmes stories, there always was a state of uncertainty, usually a murder, that needs to be explained, and we know what kind of people would, be, would care if it was actually solved. We can actually map this basic idea onto marketing situations to identify business problems. Another thing to be careful about if as a marketing researcher is to realize that most of the business problems that you'll identify, they're often in their proto-stage, ill-structured for research. Um, in other words, when you're confronted with a business problem, they rarely come in a format that's pre-packaged for uh, investigation with research. First, managers usually will phrase to you problems as a request for normative advice. In other words, what should we do? How do we get our fans to come back? How do we sell more seats? How do we win back market share? Should we cut prices? They're asking for advice. Or another, another common business problem in its initial presentation is that of a symptom, but not necessarily articulating its underlying lying causes that might need investigation. For example, season ticket sales are down 20% from last year. Clearly that's a problem. No one is buying at our fan shop. That clearly would be a problem if you're a retailer of sports goods. Or maybe just people on Twitter are pissed about our brand. Again, 
These are symptoms. They don't necessarily speak directly to underlying causes. So the issue here is marketing research never directly provides normative advice. It never tells you exactly what should be done. The should answer is always an interpretive lens that's conducted after that's done after the research is conducted. Good research provides objective information that could maybe give normative advice. Okay? So given that we're often going to see business problems presented this way, that means we as the researchers have to work with management to help construct these in a way that's more amendable to empirical investigation. So how do we actually identify and determine what the research problem might be? Well, we have to identify good questions. That's very tricky. Like, how do you identify a good research problem or a good research question to ask? Um, your accompanying assignments that come along with uh, this class uh, help you work on this even more. But let's investigate this and learn how to do this in one way. So we're going to start with something called the iceberg principle. Okay, the iceberg principle is a little bit of a strained metaphor, but I see it so common, maybe it, it'll serve us some use here. Okay, you might know about icebergs that often the visible portion of the iceberg is only the tip. In other words, the tip of the iceberg reflects only a tiny portion of what really is underneath the water. Um, in our scenario here, what we're saying is the symptoms, the problem that's easily visible by the manager, such as high customer churn rate, losing market share, sales decrease, negative public relations, or shopping cart abandonment. And by the way, if you don't know what shopping cart abandonment is, I'll give you a hint, it's not about grocery stores. But really the problems that we're thinking, trying to worry about are the true root causes of these symptoms, the underlying issues, or the things below the waterline. So maybe poor training of service personnel can lead to some of these symptoms. Maybe your product mix is suboptimized. Sub you have a poorly designed website or you're positioned in the market incorrectly. These are the things that actually cause the symptoms. These are the things that are usually more worthy of our investigation. So in other words, we might do research to establish what the symptoms are, just like a doctor might take your temperature, right? However, what, we're really, what really justifies conducting research is conducting research into whether or not or how much these actually underlying causes exist. These are the things that if we quantify them, if we address them, and if we investigate them, they're the things that provide much more direct um, opportunities for advice for managers to take corrective action. As an example that's somewhat relevant to San Diegans now, um, are we dealing with dockless bike chaos or maybe dockless scooter chaos? There's uh, no shortage of news articles, and go ahead and do a little Googling, you'll find plenty of them where there are a lot of complaints about these new dockless bike systems that are being introduced into San Diego. Bikes being discarded, put it in places where they impede pedestrians, local communities such as Little Italy, purposely removing the bikes from areas, um, and them being vandalized, and so on and so forth. I think it's fair to say that there, we can see the symptoms, we can see that they're, they're discarded on the street, we can see that they're being cluttered, we can see that they're being just being um, misused in certain cases. But what we don't know precisely is what are the underlying causes. I'm going to take a pause here and ask you to think about it. Okay. Did you think of some of the underlying causes that might exist for this problem with the dockless bike systems? Now here's where I want to challenge you. Don't become fixated on your explanation for the cause. At this point, we're speculating on what the causes could be. You're not being, don't commit yourself to believing that you're right. We haven't conduct, collected data or conducted research yet. So think harder, think more, think broader. What are other things that could cause this that are not part of what you readily see? Okay, let's move on. Now we spent a little time talking about the differences between business problems and research problems or research questions. Um, but let's add a little more clarity by how they're different from one another. So let's look at the following three research questions. First, what percent of my customers say they are unhappy with our new service? What is the most common reason they provide if they are unhappy? Why does that qualify as a research question? Well, first, do both, can both of those questions actually be objectively answered with empirical data? Uh, yeah, they absolutely could. We could find out what percent of people are unhappy with our new service. Um, in addition, we could totally find out through a variety of different mechanisms what's the most common reason. And what you might notice here is that second part of that question. What is the most common reason? That would be one approach to try to get to the underlying causes of that unhappiness. And otherwise, in other words, the first part of the question is about a symptom, but the other part is about trying to figure out the cause. So not only is it a research question, it might be a research question that's very useful to managers. Let's skip ahead and look over at the third one. If we segment our entire market into 10 different lifestyle groups, which of the two segments will have the greatest average likelihood to respond favorably to our new advertising campaign? How many consumers in each of these segments are there? 
what is the demographic composition of these segments? Hmm. Could we investigate each one of these empirically? Sure, absolutely. The first part, if we segment our entire market into 10 different lifestyle groups, apparently in this scenario, there's already 10 different schemas that exist. That's not really what our research is about. Those are given to us, those are assumptions. But we could then, based on the, our study, slice out all the people that we collect data on and identify which two of those segments are most likely to respond favorably to our campaign. This might be presenting videos or presenting a pitch to them via an online survey tool. Then we could always quantify how many people belong to these segments. So are, these 10 different segments are probably not all equally sized. We could collect data through a variety of different mechanisms to estimate how large each one is. And then we could actually also figure out their demographic composition. Maybe we collect primary data surveys to figure out what their demographic composition is, or maybe we use some sort of secondary data tools. Maybe we use the US Census. Uh, depends on how these lifestyle groups are segmented. Let's briefly talk about research hypotheses. So what exactly is a hypothesis? Well, a research hypothesis is an unambiguous claim about what the researcher believes they will find after completing the study. In other words, it's a clear, unambiguous prediction. I keep saying that word unambiguous. It's important that the hypothesis is something that after you see the results and after you conduct the analysis, you can clearly state whether it's true or false, whether you're right or you're wrong. Now, sometimes because of sampling, error, and other things like that, it might be unclear. But the way the hypothesis is actually articulated should be such that it is possible to clearly say yes or no. Now, it's important to understand not all marketing research projects actually have hypotheses. Um, exploratory studies, for example, rarely, if ever, have a hypothesis. I mean, if exploratory studies are all about just clarifying terms or finding things that you didn't anticipate to find in the first place, well, that would seem to run counter against what a hypothesis is. You can't d claim something unambiguously if you don't really know what you're looking for. Or in other instances, um, a marketer might have a very clear research question or objective, but they don't have any pre-existing hypothesis. But how do you make a hypothesis? Like, where do they come from, typically, in marketing research studies? Uh, there's three places that you're likely to base a, a research hypothesis uh, from. One, previous research. Um, as an example here, uh, here's my hypothesis. Uh, over 70% of SDSU students support the legalization of marijuana and support the opening of a dispensary within a quarter mile from campus. So where does this come from? If you look at this Pew Research study, um, that's linked here, it'll take you to a national poll that shows that millennials, over 70% of them, support the legalization of marijuana. It doesn't speak about dispensaries at all. Um, basically, I'm taking this previous research and slightly making a few assumptions that those who support the legalization will also support dispensaries, and I'm now making this claim specific to SDSU students. So the previous research isn't a literal interpretation. I mean, that's why I'm doing my own study, or in this case, I propose I'm doing my own study. Um, and I'm making a claim, but it is clearly based on previous evidence and standards. Hypotheses also typically come from managerial assumptions. So it's just an example here. More than 25% of our current customers will be interested in spending $5 a month to upgrade to a new premium version of our app. In this case, this is forcing a manager to clearly articulate their beliefs towards whether or not someone's willing to pay for a upgrade or a new VIP version of, of an online app. Um, very rarely will you hear managers walk in and if they believe that this is a good idea, will they say literally exactly 25%. But in this case, for a hypothesis, we need to establish clear, unambiguous standards to know whether we're right or wrong. Sometimes theory actually guides it. So, for example, consider this claim. Over 80% of respondents who say they are likely to buy the new iPhone will do so within nine months of its release. Um, this hypothesis is pretty straightforward. It's saying that if you find out that people say they're likely to buy it, almost all of them, or 80% or more, will do so within nine months. Basically, this claim is hinging on the premise that those, who, those people's intentions will closely match their actual behaviors. This comes from something called the theory of reasoned action, that all is equal and people's stated intentions are a good reflection of their actual behavior. Later this semester, we'll learn about how people's stated intentions are not the best predictor of their actual behaviors, but in this illustration here, we can clearly see that it does guide our formation of a hypothesis.